A couple of weeks ago, I put out a video for a platform builder on Java Edition, but today we'll be looking at the Bedrock side of things. And things are actually looking pretty good here on Bedrock. For one thing, the redstone is just overall a lot simpler, plus it even works with sand right from the start. So say goodbye to lakes, I guess. However, unlike on Java Edition, it's not able to run quite as fast. On Java, we were able to run it on a 10 game tick clock, but here we have to go with a 12 game tick clock instead. Which, a little bit of clarification on that, I didn't really cover this in the last video even though I probably should have. Uh, yeah, game ticks are the same length between both editions. It's just that on Bedrock, the redstone interactions get aligned to even game ticks only, so to speak. And with that, let's actually just jump straight into how it works, shall we? Uh, for the most part, it's quite similar to how it is on Java. We start by pushing blocks outwards in a line, and then we use this thing right here, which basically acts as a conveyor belt to make the line as long as we could possibly want. So yeah, with this one, you just push, you just push blocks in, and then it shuffles them further along, like so. Then we have this part right here, which let's go over to a more isolated version. Yeah, so every time it sees a block coming in, it just pushes the block out. And you'll notice that it is also trying to pull on this slime structure right here. And that is so that if it gets stuck for some reason, specifically if the row has filled up, then it will move to the next row. And then finally, to make the rows arbitrarily wide, we use kind of a combination of the other two things. So it starts off with the conveyor belt style where you, uh, yeah, you push the blocks in and then it just shuffles them further along. But then just like the row starter, we have this sticky piston trying to pull in a way so that if it's not able to because the rest of the row is already filled, it will move on to the next row instead. You'll also notice that it makes this little hole here. So the trick there is just make sure that it makes that hole soon enough that the previous extension will be able to fill it in before it also gets stuck and moves on. Now, as for how it's different from Java Edition, well, for starters, the basic conveyor concept. The way that it works on Java Edition, well, it actually has to do a bit of magic to account for block dropping. On, on Java, we have block dropping, which basically you short pulse the piston, and the slime block will just get stuck out here instead of being retracted. And in this case, we don't want that, even though that is often a useful feature. Uh, so to avoid it, we have to do some stuff involving quasi-connectivity, and part of that main detail is we have to update this block. So on Java Edition, what will happen is you place that block and nothing happens. I mean, nothing happens here either, but then once you move the block in uh, and it reaches this point, then it will extend because it updated the piston. But here, as you saw, that did nothing. Fortunately, on Bedrock, we don't have to worry about block dropping at all, so we can just put redstone dust on it and call it a day. Assuming that we fix both of them. Going in the same order as on Java Edition, we'll go to the row extensions next. Uh, but here, well, we can't just put redstone dust because it's a flying machine. So we'll have to do the next best thing, which is to just do this. And this unfortunately means that uh, we'll have to push one less block, and therefore the extensions will have to be closer together, but that's okay. And then from there, we just simply have it try to pull back on this piston. So if the piston extends, then it won't be able to move it because you can't move extended pistons. Um, but if it does get stuck, then, well, it will move on to the next row, or at least mostly. And then from there, it's just a matter of making it slightly more compact and finishing off the part to make it an actual flying machine. And yeah, we have the row extension already complete. Now you may be wondering, if it was this simple, why didn't we do the same thing on Java? Well, remember when I said that on Java, the block stream has to reach this point in order for the piston to extend? Well, that means that if we're pushing blocks in and we have this somehow trigger the attempt to move forward, then the very first time we receive a block, well, uh, yeah, it's just going to pulse that piston. And because this one didn't move, it assumes that it's time to move forward. However, there are ways to deal with that on Java Edition. Uh, you can uh, long pulse it, for example. 
and well, okay, it actually long pulses it here or makes it a longer pulse. So you could do that, uh, but then you have a new problem. Uh, the the extra compact solution on Java Edition also takes care of the fact that the observers actually fire too quickly for the conveyor extension. So you'd also have to put an extra delay on it. So in the end, you've got something like this just powering the one piston, and then you have to move that around and get all the other stuff in there. And yeah, that is why we don't do that on Java. And that brings us to the row starter, which just like on Java Edition caused a lot of problems and it was a lot of the same problems. And a lot of that comes from the conveyor extensions. You know, the conveyor and the row starter are trying to push the exact same blocks at the exact same time, which doesn't go very well, uh, especially on bedrock. So the first thing we do is uh, we make it so that the conveyors start off not fully assembled and therefore not pr exactly functional. And then once the row starter has reached a point where it's safe to use, we actually finish assembling it by pushing the block over. But this leads to the much more difficult problem. Because of how these conveyors work, they have to have a gap after it. However, that gap comes from either there's just not being any blocks there before because the block stream hasn't reached that point or because of the last time that it triggered. However, if we just finished assembling a new conveyor extension, well, neither of those are going to be true and there will not be a gap here. And this lack of a gap can cause problems because it means the first time we use the extension, it'll move the blocks twice in a row. And uh, yeah, our row starter is only designed to handle the blocks being moved like normally, not double moved. Now on Java, the main thing that this would cause is it would move to the next row too early, but here on Breadrock, yeah, it just breaks things because, you know, the random piston update order. So we have to come up with a more creative solution. The solution I came up with, I'm particularly proud of. The problem is when moving to the next row, there isn't a gap when starting a new extension. So what if every time we move to the next row, we just make a gap regardless of whether we're starting a new extension or not. This way, yeah, the blocks will not double move, and if we're not starting a new extension, then okay, it just has to fill in the gap first. However, you may have noticed that this brings this block here, and this piston did not trigger. That's because, well, this is two separate segments, and this observer moves before the piston, so it just doesn't trigger. However, this is actually kind of a blessing in disguise. Even though we did create a gap here, uh, this extension can still be used very quickly compared to when this thing moves. And if this were to trigger right away, then we'd have to slow everything down to an 18 game tick clock just to make it retract in time. Which, by the way, an easy way to do that would just be replace that with a normal piston and put an observer like that so that just the moment it moves, it immediately extends. But obviously, we don't want to run it on an 18 game tick clock, we want to run it on 12, because that's faster. So, instead of doing that, we just double down on the whole not moving right away. We just let it push one block past, and now, I mean, now everything's set up so that every time a block comes in, it's not going to go past anymore. So, in order to fix it, we'll just have another piston here, which will be in the right place to push it out, uh, but then it's just a matter of activating it. But the thing is, we also need this one to wait. We can't just extend it right away or else it will end up blocking things anyways. So we want to wait until the first blocks come in, but we only want to do it once because if this one keeps extending over and over, then every time this tries to pull back, it's not going to be successful, and it's never going to move to the next row. Fortunately, it's actually easier to only trigger it once. All we need to do is, whenever a block comes in, we push an observer forward, and yeah, that pretty much takes care of all of that. The only other thing to note, I guess, is that in order to help take care of push limit problems, uh, we have this extension right here that I kind of figured out. Basically, you just push a piston into here and it will immediately trigger without needing any extra parts on it or the thing that it's actually pushing. 
And one other detail that's really nice about this is this piston and this piston, if you watch closely, they actually trigger at the same time. And this helps out a lot because turns out we do need to fix the next extension, like right away. And so we only have enough to put this one piston, but that is barely enough. And as for the rest of the flying machine, well, we just connect it to this part. And this also moves in time. It's basically the exact same thing as just a regular pushing extension, whether you're doing it observerless or or otherwise, you, you get the idea. And uh, yeah, that is pretty much all of the parts taken care of. But then just as I was about to make the video, I realized that even in this state, it is more complicated than it probably needs to be. That is because on Bedrock, well, we have movable block entities, which means we can move lava around using a dispenser or have a movable dropper for giving the player items. So why place the blocks all the way over there and bring them here when we could just generate or place the blocks right here? Then you can just have a bunch of row extensions and then go pretty much as far as you want. And this actually also helps with simulation distance problems. Um, well, on Bedrock, the simulation distance isn't particularly large, but it turns out with this solution, even on the smallest simulation distance, you can fill in an entire map uh, so long as you are doing it with a stone generator of some sort. Though also at that point, why even have these row extensions at all? Why not just move the stone generator back and forth? And this effectively creates three possible options, either the two conveyor method like on Java, the one flying machine and one conveyor method, and then just a three-way flying machine method. And the results actually turned out very nicely. Well, at least for basalt. The one for cobblestone is a bit bigger, but this one also is able to run slightly faster due to certain reasons. And as for player placement, I just uh, haven't even finished it yet. And yeah, I'm just going to cover this in a separate video, as well as the three-way if I ever do actually make that. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just have to see how that goes. Anyways, let's get a tutorial going. It's not going to be the best tutorial, but... Anyways, so first of all, unless you want to figure out simulation distance stuff yourself, uh, don't go more than 33 wide by 47 long. And then if that means you have to do something in multiple stages, you'll need to do this one, then this one, then this one, then this, this, this. Just go in that order. So because of that limitation, I'm assuming you're probably going to be using this for sand. Start by taking moss or leaves and building this backwards L shape. And uh, ideally, you want this to be the short side and that to be the long side, just because that's going to reduce the overall redstone you'll have to use. Though it could also make it so that you have to do more digging, so I don't know. Speaking of digging, if you are doing this underground, probably filling lava in the nether, you'll need to make sure the entire width of the platform is cleared out. Four blocks tall, starting three blocks before the beginning, and then going to at least one block past the end. You'll also need to clear out this tunnel right going along the long side. It needs to go one block below the platform, going to three blocks above it. So same as everything else. Also going five blocks out, starting five blocks before the beginning, and going to at least two blocks past the end. And for this bottom layer specifically, if there's anything that doesn't stick to slime blocks, such as obsidian or lava, then you don't have to worry about it. And for sand, you'll need to make sure to have uh, all of these blocks filled in, very necessary, starting one block before, and then going along this entire side. So I guess, yeah, if you're filling in sand, then the platform will go one block further out than the actual area you're covering. Anyways, uh, yeah, so first, just start by going to the end of the short side. We're going to lay out the observers. This won't, there won't be much, but oh well. Uh, you'll need to have exactly 12 blocks followed by an upwards observer. And then you're going to repeat th this every nine blocks. 
until the next one would go past the end. But if your final one was in any of these three spots, you'll need to move it back to here so that you have a three block gap right here. All right, now for the long side, start by going four blocks and then an upwards observer. And now you need another upwards observer every seven blocks. So it'll be a six block gap followed by an observer. And you just want to do that all the way to the end. And uh, yeah, once you get to the end, you can place an immovable block such as obsidian just past the end and get rid of that observer. You don't need it. Uh, now for each of the ones on the long side, you're going to do sticky piston, slime block, redstone dust, and then a solid block off to the side. And just do that for each of them. Now for the row extensions, it's going to be slightly different based on if you are underground or not. But for the one that you would not do underground, do a slime there. Two slime here, glazed terracotta, followed by a slime block. Put a sticky piston there and one there. Now go get on this one. Place an observer and a piston, and it should get the right orientation. Three slime blocks, and you're done. Just do that for all of them. And then if you are underground, you're going to do slime, sticky piston, two slime blocks, glazed terracotta, do an L shape with the slime, place a sticky piston like that, place an observer right there, a piston there, and one slime block there, and just do that for all of them. And I, I do gotta say, this is looking pretty wimpy compared to the one on Java. <laughs> Anyways, now come back over to this corner, place two blocks like that, and another one there, and an observer. Now come over here, two sticky pistons. Now come over here, one piston, observer, regular block, two slime blocks, three slime blocks, redstone block. Now come right here and put one slime block, two normal blocks, and a slime block. And then from here, place a sticky piston there and there with another slime block there. Now come over here and do an L shape while you get up onto here, I guess. And then an observer like that, piston, and then come back over here, one slime block, one regular piston, and one redstone block, and there you go, you're done with this part. Now for the part where you're going to be placing blocks, place a piston right there, two blocks there, two non-sticky blocks such as moss here. It's very important that they do not stick to pistons. Anyways, place a couple of blocks there, two dust, up, upwards observer, and another dust on top. Put a lever and turn it on. Now right here you're going to want an observer facing up and a, into a block, and then a dropper. And then if you want to fill in uh, these parts to protect yourself, go ahead. Now go ahead and place that there uh, and fill it up. Though if you want to use a shulker unloader because you have like a lot of sand or something, uh, I, I didn't really design this very well with shulker unloader in mind, but uh, here we go anyways. Place a hopper there, a double chest or something there with the hopper pointing into it. This is where the empties are going to go. Now come over to right here, place a block right there, another there, with two rails on top, and an observer right there, solid block, piston, comparator, regular block, and then a torch, and then another torch, and then a dispenser. Now go ahead and fill in uh, all of this surrounding area with glass, but leave an opening. Then just uh, go ahead and make sure that you have enough hoppers and double chests to hold all the shulker boxes you want and fill the whole thing up, uh, but leave out one of those boxes, place it right here, and close it off. And uh, it's very important that all of those shulker boxes actually have stuff in them, as empties will break it. I was too lazy to actually fill it for the demonstration, but yeah, don't do that. And then to run it, make sure that whatever block you'll be placing, you don't have any of it in your inventory anywhere, except for one of it in your first hotbar slot, and then possibly other stuff to uh, seal this off and get out or whatever. Uh, anyways, come in here, close that off if you need to. And then to run it, just go ahead and flick the lever and then just start placing blocks. And every time you successfully place a block, it'll give you another one. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, sorry for the low quality tutorial.
Anyways, that's all for today. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, it is still June, so make sure to gay smash the subscribe button. Uh, yeah, don't anger the water spirits too much. But most of all, trans rights are human rights.